And for large tech companies, I absolutely think it's conservative. You want to hire people at the level that you know that they will excel at. Let's say we're on the defense of senior and inch two. You had them at senior and they struggle from day one. Uh, they get on a pip uh, because, you know, like these companies are very demanding. And if someone is, is a maybe in, in the first six months, uh, some companies might decide, let's put them on a pip and, and they cleared. But now they have a mark on their on their thing that they, they were on a pip and they're at the same level for, for now four or five years and they, they'll just quit. All right, hey everyone, welcome to the next episode of the Tech Pack series. And my guest for today is Gary Gay, who we met through Twitter. And he actually is a hiring manager. He was a hiring manager at Uber and uh, also a very senior IC at several companies before that. So I'm really excited for him to uh, come and talk about his experience with hiring people into a company and also how does he think about promotion and like what level does he hire people in at um so gary why don't we start with some rapid fire before we get into your proper intro uh what is one piece of advice that has changed your life well a piece of advice that i wish i would have taken the first time it was given and it would have changed my life is do not write angry emails i wrote, wrote an angry email when i was in ic and my manager pulled me aside and said gary if you ever had an angry email just delete it and yeah. every time i did not do that a few years later it always bit me so don't write on yeah. your emails. <laughs> Definitely. I feel like um, sometimes the writing of the email itself is cathartic, but then don't send it. So that's all the yeah. advice I've heard. Um, totally. Cool. Okay. Just give us a brief background about yourself and what you're doing now. Yeah. So I, I've been software engineer. I was a software engineer for quite a long time, for almost, almost 10 years, starting at smaller companies. I'm originally from Hungary. Uh, so I, I worked there full time for a few years and moved to the UK worked at consultancies, then worked at investment bank, then at Skype, Skyscanner, a largest startup a competitor to Kayak, and then spent the last four years at Uber. And throughout, I, I, I went through the loop of the new grad uh, engineer, software engineer. Uh, I, I was a principal engineer. I was then a senior engineer at Uber, and then I moved into engineering management. And I was I was a tech lead slash engineering manager for the last five years. So, at, at, and, and, and that, that's, I, we might touch on that, but, so I kind of went through, I, I think this is a pretty typical path on how you get into management after doing many years as, as an IC. Yeah, and I think that the, the interesting thing here is that, you know, like I had an interview just recently with Clement talking about my experience as a senior engineer, a staff engineer, and I talked about how, you know, there's a lot of technical work and direction setting and architecture. And I think the interesting thing here is you've done that aspect, but you've also now transitioned or you were at Uber, a hiring manager. So you have like both both perspectives, right? So can you talk about what exactly did you do as a hiring manager? What were the main motivations for you uh, to become one? And when you're saying hiring manager, do you mean engineering manager or, or do you mean hiring manager? Because they're kind of, they might be the same thing, but they might also be different. So maybe it's good to touch on it yeah, to clarify you, that. Yeah, can you talk about the difference between the two? So like in my view, a hiring manager is a person on the hiring loop who will be hmm deciding is this person a yes or a no and it's almost always mm -hmm. at least at the likes of uber and other companies i know similar ones it's always an engineering manager so uh, i almost would say a hiring manager is a subset of, of engineering managers uh, and i i was on on interviews for example as an engineering manager where i kind of stepped into let's say do a technical interview or or i was doing a bar raiser but i was not the hiring manager so i was not the, the ultimate decision maker or, or not the person who's who's team this person might start on and the interesting thing with hiring managers is some companies the hiring manager is your future manager at companies like uber mm -hmm. and i've heard google as well i'm not sure what it's like at facebook but the hiring manager might not be your future manager they might just be playing that role in the interview process so like i think becoming a hiring manager is not really a choice it kind of comes with being an engineering manager but to your question of like becoming an engineering manager uh, to me when I was at Skyscanner, I was basically a tech lead and I became this engineering manager or, or tech lead accidentally. They said, well, you know, you're, I was the only engineer writing a mobile app and we needed more people. I'm like, we need more people. They're like, sure, hire some people. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I started Googling and, you know, looking at how to do it. And I kind of accidentally became a manager. And then at Uber, I moved as a senior engineer. There were no like tech lead positions. And I, I didn't, I, I thought it was like fine. Like I, I wasn't really in it for the management, but when I arrived there, we had a lack of management. My, my manager had 30 reports at some point, And I put up my hand saying like, you know what, I've done this before. I was kind of doing the work as well. And I, I wanted to push myself and see if, uh, if, I, if I was any good at it, if I would like it. And I felt that at that point, I always, almost did 10 years as a software engineer working full time. I felt I had more, more to learn there. And I'm, I'm glad I did it. Uh, so yeah, it was a good experience for me at least. 
Yeah, so when you transitioned into the manager role, what was your primary motivation? Like, what, what was there a new skill set that you wanted to learn? Or how, how did how did you have that conversation with your manager? Of like, here's how I'm going to gauge whether the transition is successful or not. I, at that point, I was kind of already doing the, the job because we had this massive project yeah. where I ended up project managing and I found myself managing this project of 20 people. So I was acting like sometimes staff engineers would, would play this role or, or, or senior twos or, or whatnot. I was spending most of my time just talking with people. And I figured, let me give engineering management a try if I can. So I told my manager, if there's if there's an opportunity, I'm interested. And it was for two reasons. One, I, I thought it will be interesting for me to learn. Like, how does this work at a company like Uber? What is happening behind the scenes? You know, how is the sausage being made in the factory? The other yeah. one was selfish. I figured it's a really valuable skill to know if, if you can manage people, because at some point uh, I figured I might want to do a startup or and maybe at some point I'll want to become a VP of engineering or a CTO. But if you've never managed people, you can't really do that. And I'm actually in that phase. Yeah. So since I left Uber, my next goal will be to do a startup. And I know I can manage people. I know uh, I, I was like pretty okay with what uh, getting a team together, hiring, uh, having those hard conversations when you need to be. So it gave me that skill set. And it, it, it took years to build it up. So uh, I think it, it it makes my career a little bit more versatile. Uh, and it was honestly just fun. I, I it, it felt like I went back to learning again. I, I felt like a junior when I became a manager. I, I yeah. had no clue. And I, I knew that I, I wouldn't have no clue. And I knew that I would be making mistakes. Yeah, I think think that's great advice in general, right? Like put yourself in a position where you feel like you're underwater or you don't know what's going on. And that's where you're going to get the maximum amount of learning. And the other thing you mentioned, which I think was also interesting, is that you were already acting essentially as a manager, right? And I feel like oftentimes the best reorgs or the best transitions happen when you ask people around you and it's like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Like that person was already acting as a TL or a manager or whatever else. And it just kind of, it's a seamless transition. So the best way to kind of attain a new role is start acting as if you're already in that role. And then it'll kind of just happen naturally. Yeah, and, and I would also add, like, in my case, I wasn't like saying that, hey, I want to be a manager and I'll start acting in this role. It was more like so someone needed to do it. We have this big project that was not going well. And I, I had experience. I, I, I was in a similar project. This was the the, the big Uber rewrite. Uh, we were rewriting the, the whole lab. The whole company was working on it. And in Amsterdam... Uh, no one had seen a project like this before, but I did at Microsoft when we built Sky for Xbox One and we were in a team in London uh, and uh, in the headquarters in Redmond, there was the Xbox team with, with I think, 2,000 engineers. And we had a similar setup in Amsterdam. We had 20 people and we had, uh, in, in SF, we had like hundreds of people. And I was a more junior engineer at Microsoft, but I saw a lot of parallels and I started making suggestions. I think we could do this. I, I, I think we could do that. I, uh, and people were like, oh, okay, well, I guess... Like I, I, I've seen something similar before. So it's just more, I saw an opportunity and I, I, my, my goal was really to help the team. And it was interesting because when I became a manager, so when, when this whole process went through and my manager announced it to the team, I was really nervous. Like, what is everyone going to say? And whatever I said is like, oh, awesome. Where we were kind of expecting it. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and uh, yeah. which goes back to the thing, I think an advice that if anyone wants to become a manager, the best place to do it is typically at your company. It is very difficult to become a manager if you've never been that before. You can sometimes do it if you come from a really prestigious company, like say you worked at Facebook or Apple or, or somewhere and you go to a startup and the startup might entertain this because they, they really want you. But otherwise, most companies will not take that risk with managers because a bad manager, they can poison a team and they can destroy a whole team. Like I've seen it. It's, it's a thing. Yeah, totally. I feel like building up that trust and that reputation is something that comes with time when you've already been on the team, right? It's actually very hard to just drop in and become a manager without knowing the people, knowing the team. Um, one of the things you mentioned was that one of your motivations was to like help the team, right? And a primary way that you help the team is by career growth. And so one of the things I want to ask you about is promotion. So what did the promotion process look like um, at the companies you've worked at? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about it, but then I'll, I'll be interested to talk about what, what, what you've seen in uh your path and your career. But let let me talk about Uber because I I think Uber is pretty similar to how a lot of companies work. A lot of ideas came from from actually a fact from the likes of Google, VMware, and some of the companies because a lot of the alumni, uh, Uber came from there. And so the promotion was very, very interesting at Uber because over the four years, we've had seven different processes every time it got tweaked a little bit. 
And we went to, when I joined, uh, when I was not yet a manager, the way promotions worked is club managers got together and they kind of discussed, uh, they had a calibration meeting and, and they kind of talked about promotions. It went in front of the manager's only committee and it came back as a decision. And engineers didn't have to do too many things. You know, you just got like, hey, congratulations, you're promoted. So it was, which is kind of cool because you don't have any work, but on the long term, it becomes pretty political. You're like, well, you need to, you know, work with the right manager, etc. Then, uh, around 2017, uh, Uber overhauled everything and we made it completely formal. This was the kind of a fallout of the Susan Fowler case to make sure everything is unbiased as much as possible, which meant that we had mostly like uh, five person committees where four, there were four engineers and one manager who reviewed a package uh, that you you wrote. So if you want to be up for promotion, you talk with your manager, you had to write a, a self-evaluation, your manager had to write an evaluation, you need to get peer feedback. But the kicker was that the committee could not know you. If anyone worked with you the, from the committee, they, they had to resign. So you had people mm. give you give feedback to you who never worked with you. And if you were in Amsterdam, it might have been a committee in India or in San Francisco. And because of this, this was great for not being biased, but also a lot of context got lost. So uh, mm. in this setup, the people who had a lot of written artifacts, planning documents, code reviews, they actually did a lot better which is interesting because on my team, I was a big fan of writing things down. We were a bit of a remote site uh, and this worked in our favor. But of course, a lot of people felt that this was not really fair uh, because a lot of context was lost. And towards the end of it, we had a bit of a hybrid model where up to senior levels, we had a manager only committee where it was within the org and a lot of context was there. People still had to write, but a lot more lightweight um, documentation because in, in, in this first process with the heavyweight documentation, people literally spent a month writing their their uh, promotion packet. Uh, I was in promotion meetings uh, for, for weeks. It, it was super heavyweight and really, really tiring. Yeah. So we, we had this, this hybrid where up to senior, it was a more likely process and it still worked pretty well. Above senior, for, so for senior, senior two and staff engineers, it was this, this uh, standard process. And whenever a lot of large companies do the, 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 the committees navigating committee, promotion processes can be a bit tough, especially when you're going to know. I, I've seen a lot of times. But yeah, uh, the takeaway is, I mean, I, I, I was a manager and, and one reason I really recommend people who are like frustrated with managers and, and management, which I think a lot of a lot of engineers are. I, I was always frustrated a little bit with, with my manager. When you have the opportunity to become a manager, because you'll see that it's it's not black and white. It's it's, it's pretty tough to, to make everyone happy. In fact, you cannot make everyone yeah. happy. Yeah. And... Um... I'm wondering, so definitely you have to write a self-review to justify why you want to go for promotion. How involved was your manager in, uh, in that self-review? Like, did they have to champion you and say, hey, I 100% advocate for this person. I, wanna, I want them to go for promotion. Or was it independent of what their opinion was? So it, uh, like the two were, were on paper independent. A good managers would, okay. would be checking in with, with their directs and giving them feedback. So for example, I would give a lot of feedback on the self-review so that I can tailor my manager review and, and to cover the gaps. One, hmm. one important or two important things. If your manager does not support your promotion, you're not gonna get promoted. Like we can try to beat around the bush, but something is wrong there because a manager, it, it is in their interest to, to help people promote who are there. It makes the manager look good in any normal organization. At Uber, it, if, if a manager didn't get any promotions on their team after a while, you start to get questions of what is going on. And the other part is, mm. if you, the longer a manager is in an organization, the more they know how this process works and the more they can help. In my first year, I, I kind of tried to figure it out. And after I was there for, for three years, I, I was a veteran and I, I was able to help people saying, well, I think you should focus a bit more on this. Or even you know three or six months before promotion, I was able to help them. I think you should focus on uh, you know, at ideas, work on this project because this will give you a lot more impact, visibility, whatnot. So, but... I'd like to ask you, in, in your experience, how did it work at the companies you've worked at uh, in, in general? I know you work, worked at a, a couple of different ones and you also got promoted yourself. Like, how, how did your promotion yeah. work? Yeah, totally. So I'm, I've, I've, I can talk about the experience at three companies that I've been at. First is very, sim very simply the kind of easy to talk about, which is a startup. I was at a five-person startup or a four-person startup when I graduated. And there was no promotion. It was just like literally do what you can to survive. Uh, so there was like no calibration. Of course, right? if you have four people, what are you going to yeah. calibrate against? Um, 
Then the next company was Pinterest. And when I joined Pinterest, it was around 400 people. And so that was a very interesting time to join the company because I feel like they were just formalizing the process. Mm. And I feel like, to be totally honest, I feel like they basically, um, kind of like what you described with Uber, like they had a lot of people from Google or VMware or these big companies. And they basically copied the process from those companies. And I feel mm. like it was because of this blind copying, it turned out to be a much heavier process than it needed to be given how small the company was. Yeah. And so like at Pinterest, you had to write a self review, then another review for why you're justified for promotion. Mm. Then your manager has to write another layer on top of that. And then also you have peer review and that all gets bundled into a packet, which goes to some anonymous committee. And then like three weeks later, they'll come back to you with a decision. So I, I think definitely the initial rounds of performance review <clears throat> and promotion review at Pinterest were quite painful actually. Um, and then finally, at Facebook, I think it's uh, actually it works out really well. I'm, I'm pretty happy with the with how the system works here. It's basically um, you write a self review. There's no extra step for promotion, but you just have a discussion with your manager. They'll take the feedback from yourself and your peers, and they'll kind of calibrate you against other people on the team. Mm -hmm. And if they think that hey, you're actually exceeding expectations for a uh, long enough amount of time, like mm -hmm. it's sustainable then they'll actually promote you. Um, and that goes into some sort of manager calibration that they have every and, and six months. did you need to prepare? Because you were promoted to staff at Facebook, right? Did you need to kind of prepare? Like, did you, you know that there's going to be like this period or like in, in this half, there's going to be this meeting where it's going to be decided or was it just kind of ongoing and at some point someone turned around and said, congratulations. Yeah, I mean, I think, right. That was, that was one of the nice things I like about uh, the, the way it worked at Facebook is that there wasn't any kind of single meeting where it's like i have to prepare and like justify my case it was very like what we what, what the company says is that it's tr uh promotions are trailing mm -hmm. in the sense that you should already be operating at that level for you know three months or six months before getting promoted right otherwise it's not clear whether you're yeah. going to sustain that level once you get promoted um and so you know like probably for a period of seven or eight months with my manager, I had an ongoing discussion about, hey, what are the gaps? Am I actually operating at that level? And it was very clear, you know, uh, two months prior to the promotion, I would say that, you know, I felt pretty good about it. My manager felt pretty good about it. So there was no surprise really when I actually came through. That, 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 that is a really nice process because what I found at, at, at least at Uber, promotions were really stressful. Every six months, there was this, and everyone knew there, there was the, the promotion meeting where the decision will come out and managers would know, but you had to keep quiet and there was an appeals process. It was very stressful for managers. I mean, it, yeah. it's funny to say, because I think people assume that managers are not stressed, but it, it was really stressful. Like I got really, really upset when two people on my team did not get promoted on, on the first round for, I think, process mistakes. And I spent like weeks behind the scenes trying to fix it and I could fix one of them, but not the other. And I had mm. a decision that I, I, I just did, I disagreed with. And it's really, like, as a manager, that's not cool. Like, you can't really say like, hey, yeah. I think you should have been promoted, but the company, like, because you're a manager, yeah. like, you, you cannot do that. So it's, it, these processes, uh, like, again, it, it's, I, I kind of understand how difficult it is because I've talked with the HR people, with the people who designed the promotion. It's really hard to do a process that works for 20,000 people because that's how much it needed to work for Uber. It wasn't just engineering specific, but yeah, um, and as a base truth, if people who are not promoted will always be sour. Like I, I was also right. very close to not being promoted myself and I would have been very sour about it. Yeah, actually, given how taxing and how stressful it is to actually get promoted at these companies, that was the kind of next thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, when you hire people from outside the company as, in your role as a hiring manager, right? How do you think about the decision about what level to come in at because you know like i have a lot of friends and myself included who when they talk to the recruiter the recruiter will say hey you know you're on the border of this level and this level and you know if you get to that level it's going to be actually very hard for you so we recommend just down leveling one level so you're going to have an easier time when you join the company so like what what are the incentives of the company to up level or down level someone when you hire them externally I mean, I, I actually did a video about this uh, on how big tech hiring is conservative. And for large tech companies, I absolutely think it's conservative. You want to hire people mm -hmm. at the level that you know that they will excel in. And you do this for two reasons. Like it might seem a, bit, a little bit cruel, but one of them is if, if you hire someone 
who then goes out and gets promoted in a year or a year and a half to the next level and then a year and a half later to the next level, that, that person like has a really good trajectory and they're probably gonna stay and, and who knows, you know, if they come in as eng two, they, they might make it to staff or even senior staff in like five or six or seven years, something like that, which is awesome. On the other hand, if you hire that person, let's say let's say it's an eng, eng two, let's say we're on the defense of senior and eng two, you hire them at senior and they struggle from day one, uh, they get on a pip, uh, because you know, like these companies are very demanding, and if someone is is a maybe in, in the first six months, uh, some companies might decide let's put them on a pip, and and they clear it, yeah. but now they have a mark on their on their thing that they, they were on a pip, and they're at the same level mm. for for now four or five years, and they they'll just quit, like they they're now struggling, and the difference was. Uh, maybe the the that the first person might have been so happy that they got that senior offer, and the other one might have been dis disappointed with the edge too. Uh, so, but because of this, this is the reason of, of uh, giving this thing. And also, as as a manager, it's not great if you have like people on a team who who might not be performing. So, that's the. That's the reason, and and I know some people say, oh, it's it's a lot easier to interview around and get a higher offer sometimes than being promoted internally. But this this is also not entirely the case. It's 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 clear if on the interview you you do give those signals that you are able to perform, and the more this might be true up to senior level, but above that, you people typically look at your track record, like at the staff, senior staff, etc. Mm. Level. I'm in Silicon Valley. There's so many companies around, and you know if you're having a hard time getting promoted at your current company a very common behavior is just, okay, let me go interview at three or four other companies. And if one company wants me enough, they, they will up-level me. And so I feel like that attitude is actually quite common, but it sounds like you actually feel like there might be some downside to going that route because you might be put on a PIP or you might have some issues when you do get hired in at that Yeah, and, and like in Europe, just to be clear, like PIPs are a lot more rare in Europe. Mm. Like at, at Uber, we did have, I, I had someone on my team on a PIP, but this was one person in, in four years. And uh, it, it is more rare, but, uh, I felt actually that in, in Amsterdam and in Europe, I think we were a lot more conservative in hiring because we wanted to make sure that those people hit the ground running. Uh, employment laws are a bit more different as well. It's not at will employment, so it's permanent employment, mm -hmm. which means your job is a lot more secure, uh, which also means, in, in turn, it means that the leveling will be more conservative as well. If if we had any inclination of like, ah, oh, we're not sure, uh, we would just do, we would offer a level down. So the employment laws in Europe may actually be one reason why Euro European tech companies are going to be more conservative. And in, in some sense, that results in kind of lower compensation. Well, yes, I know it's a bit tricky. It's not just the employment laws, but typically for a senior, we would expect a senior at any level, mobile engineer, backend engineer, or web engineer to have done something similar, similar skills. Mm -hmm. Basically, like Zuber, ship something to millions of people. Right. It's really hard to do that in, in Europe. So that's also a chicken and egg. There's a lot of people who would be capable. They just they just worked at a startup that you know had a hundred thousand customers, and we're like, well, yeah, yeah, unsure about that. So, uh, you know, like that's and also let's not forget the pay. Uh, typically in Europe, uh, an eng two level might be a lot higher than most senior levels in in startups, mm. like like a lot higher specifically because uh, Uber paid equity. We had uh, up, upfront cash bonuses. So actually, a lot of people would take a you know, title cut, but have a big pay bump to start to start with going from, let's say, senior to eng two or from principal or, or staff to senior engineer. You actually have a couple of videos in your channel about compensation. So uh, and also, I think we're going to yeah. we're going to do one more video talking about negotiation compensation on your channel. Exactly. We'll, we'll link that. Anything else you want to share before we wrap up? One more thing I'd like to add. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I recently uh, released a book called Building Mobile Apps at Scale, which is the things that I've learned at Uber uh, at on what it's like to build large mobile apps. It's a great read for mobile engineers. And also if you're working with mobile engineers, so if you're a backend or a web engineer or, or not even necessarily an engineer, it's free to download until 31st of May. So uh, we'll, we'll pop the link below on this video. Definitely, I will leave a link to that book in the description along with a link to your channel. Um, so people can check that out if they're interested. Awesome. Awesome, well, thanks for coming on. This is super fun and I'm excited to do the video on your channel now. All right, let's do it.